invite you to join me in the prayer of confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, we are aware of the ways our faith fails short. In our pride, we wait too long to ask for your help. In our self-absorption, we ask that our will, not your will, be done. Even when you rescue us from our misery, we quickly return to our careless ways. Aware of these failures, we turn our eyes to you, trusting in your love and mercy. Amen. Friends, you do not live in the night or belong to the dark. You have obtained life and salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. In him you belong to the day. Amen. I'll invite you to stand for our hymn of praise, God Who's Giving Knows No Ending, 678. Lord be with you. Please join me in the prayer of the day. Let us pray. O oh God, you, O oh God, are our dwelling place from generation to generation, our shield from anguish and distress. You arm us as children of light with the hope of salvation, and you protect us by your love. Give us grace to build up and encourage one another as we seek wisdom and abundant life in the strength of your word and the assurance of your spirit. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of scripture. Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. We don't need to write to you about the timing and dates, brothers and sisters. You know very well that the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. When they are saying, there is peace and security, at that time, sudden destruction will attack them, like labor pains start with a pregnant woman, and they definitely won't escape. 
But you aren't in darkness, brothers and sisters, so that day won't catch you by surprise like a thief. All of you are children of light and children of the day. We don't belong to the night or darkness. So then, let's not sleep like the others, but let's stay awake and stay sober. People who sleep at night and people who get drunk get drunk at night. Since we belong to the day, let's stay sober. Wearing faithfulness and love as a piece of armor that protects our body and the hope of salvation as a helmet. God didn't intend for us to suffer his wrath, but rather to possess salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. So continue encouraging each other and building each other up, just like you are doing already. Here ends the reading. I would invite you to stand for the gospel acclamation and then the reading of the gospel, but because we're doing that as a scripture uh, presentation, drama presentation, uh, you can remain seated. So we'll sing together, God's word is our great heritage. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 25th chapter. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who was leaving on a trip. He called his servants and handed his possessions over to them. To one, he gave five valuable coins. And to another, he gave two. And to another, he gave one. He gave to each servant according to that servant's ability. Then he left on his journey. After the man left, the servant who had five valuable coins took them and went to work doing business with them. The servant who had two valuable coins took them and went to work doing business with them. The servant who was given five valuable coins gained five more. In the same way, the one who had two valuable coins gained two more. But the servant who had received one valuable coin dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. Now 
Now, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five valuable coins came forward with five additional coins. He said, Master, you gave me five valuable coins. Look, I've gained five more. His master replied, Excellent. You are a good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Come, celebrate with me. The second servant also came forward and said, Master, you gave me two valuable coins. Look, I've gained two more. His master replied, Well done. You are a good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Come, celebrate with me. Now the one who had received one valuable coin came and said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man. You harvest grain where you haven't sown. You gather crops where you haven't spread seed. So I was afraid, and I hid my valuable coin in the ground. Here, you have what's yours. His master replied, You evil and lazy servant, you knew that I harvest grain where I haven't sown and that, that I gather crops where I haven't spread seed? In that case, you should have turned my money over to the bankers so that when I returned you could give me what belonged to me with interest. Therefore, take from him the valuable coin and give it to the one who has ten coins. Those who have much will receive more and they will have more than they need. But as for those who don't have much, even the little bit that they have will be taken from them. Now take the worthless servant and throw him out into the farthest darkness. People there will be weeping and grinding their teeth. The Gospel of our Lord. You, O oh Christ. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day of worship. And we ask that as we reflect on these words, your spirit would help us to understand the implications for our own lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the gospel reading for today is a famous parable, but it is also a difficult one to figure out in terms of its meaning. In earlier English translations, this was known as the parable of the talents because that was the measurement used to describe the amount given by the master to his servants. In the Common English Bible translation, uh, it translates it the amount as a valuable coin. But that can be misleading if we look at what a talent was as a measurement in the ancient Near East. In ancient Greece, a talent was a unit of weight of approximately 80 pounds. And when used for money, it was valued for that weight in silver. As a unit of currency then, a talent was worth about 6,000 denarius, or denarii. So a denarius was the usual payment for a day's labor. Thus, a single talent was worth about 16 years of labor. In other words, a lavish amount of money. This is what I want us to consider this morning, this incredible action of the master entrusting huge amounts of money to his servants. One Bible scholar put the value of a single talent at one and a half million dollars in today's money. Thus when the common English Bible states that these were valuable coins, that's an understatement. Consider what the first part of the parable is telling us. If we recognize the master in the parable as God, and the servants as us, then what this parable is telling us is how abundantly God gifts us with the resources we need to make a difference. Imagine what you could do 
with a million and a half dollars or three million or over seven million that's the amounts being mentioned in this parable amounts that represent a real opportunity to make a difference I imagine Jesus audience was stunned by the opening of this story they would have had a hard time even imagining such a huge amount of money and then to consider that servants were entrusted with such large amounts that must have been unthinkable to them and yet that's what Jesus tells them if God is the master in the story and we are the servants consider what that is saying about God and about us first it tells us that God entrusts his people with his valuable work and gives us abundant resources to carry out that work it tells us of God's incredible generosity gifting us with more than enough resources to carry out the mission of God this parable also suggests that we are gifted by God with valuable abilities and opportunities we are seen as up to the challenge we have what it takes to do God's work if you ever feel you are unworthy or unable to do God's work this parable tells you otherwise God has presented you with an opportunity to further God's kingdom and God has entrusted you with this amazing responsibility the first two servants in the parable take the resources given them by the master and put them to work through putting these gifts these talents these resources into use the amount was doubled not immediately however it didn't happen overnight the parable says after a long time perhaps the first two servants didn't see much return for their efforts initially but they stuck with it they kept at it and eventually they were able to double what their master had entrusted them with so I think there's a message about patience and endurance in this parable as well in an age of instant gratification we are not well trained for patience and endurance all throughout the New Testament letters early Christians were encouraged to be patient and to endure the hardships they faced patience and endurance was part of a life of faith for Christians now we turn our attention to the third servant while he was not given the same amount as the first two servants it was still a substantial amount but rather than put that resource to good use he buried it where it could do nothing he didn't even put it in the bank so it could collect some interest it literally was a wasted opportunity he hid the talent given him burying the possibilities of doing something good while it is true nothing bad happened to what was entrusted to him it also wasn't used the way it was intended in other words the servant either didn't know or didn't care about what the master wanted done with the resource and to make matters worse the third servant was motivated by some questionable assumptions when called to account for what he had done with the resources entrusted to him the servant begins his excuse with the statement I knew that you are a hard man you harvest grain where you haven't sown you gather crops where you haven't spread seed let's consider those statements in the light of the overwhelming generosity the master shows in the beginning of the parable when the master's possessions were handed over to the servants there were no difficult expectations set forth no warnings about the consequences of failure nothing at all to indicate that this was a harsh master the more I thought about it the more I came to see the third servant as projecting his own faults onto the master 
In essence, he was seeking to blame others for his behavior rather than taking personal responsibility. This reminded me of the scene in the Garden of Eden when Adam blames Eve for his disobedience and then Eve blames the serpent, which is really blaming God who created the serpent in the first place. So was the third servant fearful or was he just lazy? He doesn't seem to really know what the master is like. If the master was one to be feared, then why didn't the two who were entrusted with larger amounts behave in a fearful manner as well? I don't think the reason the third servant hid the money in a hole in the ground was really because of fear. The master shoots that excuse down. The least and safest thing he could have done is deposit the money in a bank to collect interest. The more I think about this, the more I have come to see the behavior of the third servant to be based purely in self-centeredness. He doesn't see the incredible opportunity he's been given because he's only looking at the world through his own self-centered perspective. Perhaps the real reason is because the servant couldn't see the point of working with the resources entrusted to him only to benefit the master eventually. If it wasn't going to benefit him directly, then why put any effort into this at all? In other words, this servant didn't really care about what the master wanted. This servant didn't really care about the master. Consider again the first two servants. Even though they knew their hard work would ultimately end up benefiting the master, they didn't show resentment or fear. They simply got to work doing what they could to carry on the master's mission with the master's resources. And in the end, they didn't lose out. In the end, they were welcomed into a closer relationship with the master, invited to celebrate, and were subsequently put in charge of much more. It's like they were made partners in the firm. No longer simply servants, they were managers, part of the team, treated like family. This is the sad part of the story. The third servant by his attitude and actions, or lack of actions, more accurately, removed himself from the master's mission, distanced himself from his master's work, and in doing so, consigned himself to a place outside the celebration. At that point, there would indeed be weeping and regret, or maybe just wallowing in self-pity, which is its own kind of misery. If we focus on the end of the parable, this becomes a story of warning. But I think that taken as a whole, the story really is about is talking about the natural consequences of our choices. If we choose to use what God has given us to engage in the work God has called us to do, we are participating in the mission of God and we can be assured of God's commendation. Well done. You are a good and faithful servant. If, on the other hand, we choose to ignore or misuse the gifts God has given us, then we will turn in on ourselves and distance ourselves from the very one who has given us life, life with meaning and purpose. I think there is also a message of encouragement in this parable. We are told that if we simply try, if we use what God has entrusted us with, those efforts will be blessed and we will increase the kingdom of God. Now you might be thinking, but I'm not talented. God hasn't given me any special gifts. But you would be wrong. For I am convinced that everyone has been given special abilities, gifts, and opportunities to participate in God's mission in the world. My guess is that you've already been doing this work, and you just didn't know it. Next Sunday, 
in the concluding verses of Matthew chapter 25, you will encounter people who were engaged in God's mission without even knowing it. They were simply doing what they were inspired to do as followers of Jesus. They didn't know they were serving Christ by helping others. But Christ knew, and he invites them to join the celebration. Right now, this very day, and in the days and weeks to come, there will be many opportunities to engage in the mission of the Master, to do God's work. Perhaps these opportunities are hidden to you at the moment, but if you're open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, if you simply seek to do God's will each and every day, these opportunities will become apparent, if not immediately, then upon reflection. Know that God has blessed you richly with resources, both within yourself and all around you. These resources are not to be hidden, nor are they to be used for personal gain, but rather they are resources that enable us to share in the work of God for the purpose of bringing God's kingdom into its fullness. In the Lord's Prayer we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, using the words Jesus taught us. As Martin Luther explains regarding those petitions, God's good and gracious will comes about without our prayer, but we ask in this prayer that it may also come about in and among us. So do the work of peacemaking. Do the work of caring for your neighbors. Do the work of encouraging the downhearted. Do the work of showing compassion to all. Do the work of caring for creation. And trust that God has given you the necessary resources to do this work in the name of Jesus. The ability to shine the light of Christ in this world filled with darkness is there. It just needs to be uncovered. Amen. Our hymn of the day is uh, some new words set to a familiar tune. I'll invite you to stand as we sing together, O oh God, we yearn for safety.
Please join me in professing our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to make yourself comfortable for the prayers of the people. God of love and mercy, hear the prayers of your people we bring before you now. Lord, we pray for the sick who would give anything to be relieved of body pain. This day we bring before you those who are in hospital, Eugene Fletcher, Gary Hubick, and Devon Hack. We pray for their recovery. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord, we pray for the hungry who go to bed each night without needed nourishment. We pray for fairer ways of distributing food and providing food for all who hunger. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, we pray for the lonely, many shut-ins who can no longer go where they would like to be. We pray that many expressions of love will come from family and friends to lift their spirits. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for those who face a difficult decision this week and are experiencing anxiety. We pray for them clarity of thinking in making a decision. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for those who feel cut off from you through some guilt. We pray for them a fresh experience of your forgiving love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who feel cut off from members of their own family through some quarrel. We pray for them courage to take steps that lead to reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who feel compelled to overwork and for those who despise their work. We pray for them the opportunity of new vocation or a new sense of vocation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who have no work and are filled with worry about the future. We pray for them the opportunity to employ their skills and have the security of a job. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we commend to you all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray, and will speak the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
One of the ways that God makes resources available to the church to carry on the mission of God is through the collection of uh, offerings. So we give thanks to those of you who have uh, uh, gotten your offerings here one way or another through uh, e-transfer uh, or through mailing uh, in or dropping off your offerings. It is all very much appreciated. I'd like to offer this prayer now. Giver of gifts, you know the true value of the talent you bestow upon us. Open our eyes to see the possibilities they hold for our world. Transform the gifts we offer this day into signs of our commitment to bring light and love to every task we do. Transform our understanding of our potential that we may shine forth as children of light, as people of faith, and as bearers of hope through Christ our Lord, who loves and strengthens us. Amen. Our final hymn is the hymn, Lord of Light. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4, and I'll invite you to stand. Receive this blessing. Go forth as children of light, as children of the day. Go into the world knowing that God's gifts of faith, love, and hope shield you as you share those gifts with others. Beloved, go forth to share in God's joy. Amen. Live in peace, inspired by Christ to love and serve. Speak to God.